Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Area 312 Rock and Metal Vodcast. I'm Rex, along with my co-host. Hello, I'm Kent. And friends, our guests today were the soundtrack to my college years. From the song Breakaway to Pray, Up Through, Bring Me Through the Day. Their music was awesome. Please welcome with me Mark Ambrose and Steve Shannon of the band Idol Cure. Hey guys, it's an honor to have hey you guys. Great to be with you. Rock Thank on. you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Um, and we're just going to kind of go back from the beginning here, guys. Um, growing up, was music in both of your homes or not? Or how was uh, the music uh, when you were growing up uh, with you folks? Hmm. Uh, I didn't start playing until I was 17 years old. Um, and, uh, my mom played piano. That was about it. Um, yeah. So I didn't start till late. Um, and I got a job at a music store. That was, that was key. So I was able to play eight to 10 hours a day. Wow. And I remember my guitar teacher at the time, he'd been playing for three years. And I thought if he can do it. I can do it. Because I always thought, you know, you got to start when you're four years old. You play Mary Had a Little Lamb. You got to read notes and do all that. And so I went, I just learned how to play. I couldn't read. I still to this day can't read music. Um, but within three years, I was a guitar instructor. So I just played every day and loved it. So not really growing up. It wasn't the major influence in the house like you typically hear. How about you, Steve? Um, I grew up playing accordion. <laughs> from like okay. age 12 because that's what kids did right? how much did that cost they were a fortune weren't they like even at the time they were expensive yeah they're like a couple three. and and what happened was is you know to my dad's worst nightmare I actually got pretty good and so that the accordion that i had wasn't going to be good enough so they're hitting my dad up to get another you know thousand dollar accordion where boy the electric guitar i would rather have had was only 200 bucks yeah so i think dad considered that a matter of expediency right so he got me a guitar which i probably started playing in earnest at about age 15 and then i've got a few years on mark so i played all through high school and then kind of through college and beyond in secular bands and both singing and playing guitar so, in fact, Mark mentions he was 17 when he started playing and worked at a music store. He was barely 20 when I met Mark. So this was young in his musical endeavor that we both started collaborating with one another. I think Lincoln was president. <laughs> well, so then, Steve, what led you to, to go move from the guitar to singing then? How, how did that happen? Um, I was probably a better singer at the time than I was a guitar player, and I sort of didn't know it. So I felt more comfortable about my, my guitar playing, got into a band where I was singing harmonies. Harmonies were kind of the latest rage in the late 60s after the Beatles came out, right? Mm -hmm. Began singing harmonies and just began to realize, gosh, I sing better than the guy singing lead. Maybe I ought to consider a career boost, right? So began singing lead with my high school band. What happened to that guy? Did he get kicked out? <laughs> <laughs> Just wondering. Now, wait, now I became saved uh, with my now wife, Kelly, in the late 70s. Uh, we began attending Calvary Chapel. And of course, these were the days of the Daryl Mansfields, Res Band, Sweet Comfort, etc. And uh, I began looking for a mu musical outlet. I was tired of playing secular stuff. So I began, I, I made a kind of a, a group of friends at Calvary and many of them were musicians. And that's how I met Mark through that association. And our first meeting was in his mom's um, living room at the very same piano that he mentioned. And we just sat down and we played, you know, Joe Cocker and you name it, other things. And I think as well as our musical bond, we found out that we both hit it off almost instantaneously as friends. So and that was what, 45 years ago now. Awesome. Hmm. So you mentioned Joe Cocker and stuff, Steve. Um, respectively, what kind of artists or musicians or bands did you guys kind of admire growing up and, and starting out as the band? Well, I'm a Beatles guy, right? So everything came out of the Beatles, right? Sure. Um, later on, I kind of got a little bit more sophisticated in my taste. But then, uh, you know, so it went into... And I'm going to say, you know, steely Danish, a little bit more towards the jazz thing. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in college, I got into all the tuning stuff. So I would tune, E-tune, G-tune guitars, do a lot of that type of thing. So I was influenced 
more kind of the what was the folk rock at the time. But then interestingly enough, once the 80s rolled around and Mark and I got, we both kind of became that great early 80s rock stuff. So I remember going to Billy Squire concerts, Saga concerts um, with Mark, uh, ZZ Top. We would see a lot of bands together. And of course, now that we're musical comrades, we would not only admire it musically, but from an educational standpoint to see what was going on type of thing, mm -hmm. right? Mark, what about you? What, uh, what, uh, well, when I started playing guitar, I was all things guitar. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, guys that are all things guitar, they start getting into what I call gymnastics guitar, you know, it, then it becomes super complicated. And so you've, I was following guys like Al Demiola, Alan Holsworth, kind of these one off bands that most people wouldn't know, but they're known for their guitar playing. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, then I made a shift. Then I, I thought, you know, this is, this is fun. This is cool. This is challenging, but this isn't what people care about. They care about a good song. And so early, I would say, yeah, I can't remember the dates, but made a distinct shift into songwriting and what is a good song. And to me, a good song is, you know, the girl driving to the beach with the VW convertible singing a song and it's in its hooky and it's catchy. So then I shifted into really looking at hit songs. What, what did they have a like? What was different? What was similar? What was, you know, what made them a hit? And um, yeah. And so then I kind of stopped the whole gymnastic stuff um, and, and got more into that. And that mm -hmm. became the passion. So then I shifted. Then I was into thing. I was into good songs, not necessarily bands, but if they had a good song, I'm listening to it, you know, the first Mark, the first tape that Mark gave me, a cassette tape of the music he was playing, because they were yep. looking for a singer songwriter. I it was a fusion blend. Mm -hmm. It was you know no space for lyrics. It was just all like he said, musical exercise. Very good. The playing was terrific, but it was Mark said it perfectly. It was musical gymnastics, and so being a lyricist singer, it was just like hmm. Where are we going to find a hole here to sing a few lyrics, right? So we both kind of grew in that regard. Yeah. Break away, leave behind the old life. Whoa. Break away. Ooh, look around, just check it And Steve, you kind of alluded to this earlier, but I'm going to ask both of you if you could kind of tell me how did your journey with Christ begin? Well, me personally, like I said, it was going to my girlfriend at the time. This would have been the late 70s. I'm going to say circa 79. I was married in 80. Okay. Um, we began attending Calvary Chapel and I got the exposure to those bands. Uh, it was came in right in keeping. I think Mark's journey is kind of similar. He became saved at a, at a concert similarly. But you saw those bands, you saw the music, you realized that, hey, man, I don't have to go out and, and sing, you know, Sympathy for the Devil or, you know, Running with the Devil by Van Halen. I don't have to be singing that stuff because it no longer suits my ideology. So I began, and of course, you meet musicians if you're a musician. So I literally began talking to, visiting with um Chuck King was another person that was in that circle. And, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, we all kind of got together. And then you just kind of sort out who your musical tastes align with and what direction you want to take it. Mark was a keyboardist when we first started together. And our first band, Soldier, he was the keyboardist. And we had a different guitar player. So, I mean, the journey's kind of taken us along several twists and turns here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're triggering a memory. This is a lot of memory. Steve's got a great memory, by the way. That's why it's good he's here, because he'll <laughs> help me. Um, I grew up playing drums and um, and then stopped. And I got saved at a Christian concert, Jesus Movement. You saw the Greg Glory movie. Mm -hmm. Those were our people. We were at the Cove. I got baptized at Pirate's Cove, where they were showing the baptisms with Lonnie Frisbee and all that. So we were all part of that. And because I got saved, that's when I went back into music is because the music was an important piece of leading me to Christ. So that's what got me into it um, as a guitar player. 
but I got saved at that concert. I grew up a Christian scientist. Um, so I grew up in a cult um, in the home, somewhat religious. Uh, my parents went through a divorce. I was 17. Um, just went to a concert and walked forward and gave my life to Jesus. It just hit me at the right time. The picking was was good. And then from that, that point on, I, you know, we got married and then we have kids and I went into ministry, uh, when I left the band, uh, what technically the band is still together. I just told the guys, I'm not going to manage it anymore. So if somebody wants to take the helm and tell me where to show up, I'll be there. Still <laughs> waiting for the call, but we're still together technically. And like okay. I keep telling Mark, that band was his first foray into ministry. So that was the Lord tugging at his heart way back then. And just a little sidelight to give you an idea of Mark's devotion. When I met him, like he said, he worked at Guitar or Fire, and they had they would sell vintage collector guitars. And Mark had one of the most beautiful vintage, circa late 50s. 50, 50, 50, 50. 1950s. The, gold top? the yeah. gold top Les Paul. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. You don't even want to guess what that puppy's worth today. He sold that to buy his Quadra, the keyboard. So it always, to me, is a testament to Mark's dedication because... <laughs> <laughs> He'd be flying planes right now on that guitar. Be good, right? But spiritually speaking, because your question was with Jesus. Um, so yeah, I walked with the Lord, and then ultimately went into full time ministry. And so I've been in the pastor for thirty years. Um, the flip side of that. So um, it's been a journey that started when I was seventeen. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's talk about the band. Um, what were the beginnings of the band? What were the circumstances where you two, I know you guys were together, and then uh, you mentioned Chuck King. So how did the band form, um, if you guys could tell us that? Well, Mark and I, from those early beginnings in the 70s, from sitting in basements in Santa Ana and whatnot, or sitting in the front seat of cars, literally writing songs together, right, with Mark with a guitar and me sitting with a pen and paper, right? That ultimately, as we rolled into the 80s, became a band called Sojourn. And Sojourn, which for a short period of time included Chuck King, we also did a tour, and our drummer was John Elefante. So, I mean, you, oh. th there was a lot of people that were engaged in those same circles, to give you an idea. But Mark and I with Sojourn, that's when he began writing, I would say, really good songs in earnest about the very thing, using the same formula he was talking about. And of course... I was finding a way to interpret his songwriting just as he was finding ways to utilize my voice. And Sojourn played for, I'm going to say a couple, three years on what we referred to as the Calvary circuit, where you would just basically pay Calvary chapels all in around the Orange County, LA area. And then they sent us on that one little mini tour up to Northern California. And we played youth camps, prisons, that type of thing. But we were pretty much a Calvary band and played big Calvary I maybe certainly a half dozen times. So that was our initial four way. And then of course, Jim Kempner, who also came from Calvary was a pastor there. He goes out of the Maranatha music uh, format to form frontline records. And we were introduced to him and that, that was really the starting vital cure, but we entered in our record contract with no drummer, no bass player, no name and a handful of songs. So it was, it was a leap of faith, certainly. For them. Well, and, and, speaking, <laughs> and speaking of no name, I've always wondered this. Um, who came up with the band name and what does it mean? You got that. <laughs> I wasn't even around for that. Because I was in school. Right? Yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, Mark was almost not a member of Idle Cure, even though he and I had now been involved in writing and playing music together for five years at least, right? He had also earned his accounting degree from USC finance. and finance degree from USC, married and had a child, like he said. So there's a part of you saying, oh, I love music. I wanted to make it my life. But now, you know, a familyhood is calling on me. I need to go out and get to work type of thing. So the irony is it wasn't a matter of more than weeks that before Mark had played me his first rendering of Breakaway out at the pool in Long Beach at an apartment complex that he was managing. And my initial thing was, oh my gosh, dude, not only is that a great song, that's our sound. That's the sound we've been looking for that we never had in Sojourn that we need now for this new entity that's forming, right? So 
when the time came and Mark was, I don't know, you know, I'm married with a kid and I'm, I'm, I'm getting a job. I don't know if I ought to enter into the endeavor of making a record. And I asked him, well, dude, can we have breakaway and we'll give you full royalties and we'll sing it. And of course, Mark is a perfectionist. He wasn't about to let his baby. I think you there. wanted more than break. <laughs> I think they wanted a few songs, a few songs, a few songs. But it says some of the songs were interesting. Like, for example, Come Back to Me was a song he had written on keyboards. And it had a totally different phrasing, totally different feel, everything, right? But now that as we became this emerging new band, Mark realized what I think is one of his great talents, and that is rewriting songs, right? He had to rewrite the chorus to Breakaway. But Mark rewrote Come Back to Me. After Breakaway, it's probably my favorite song off the first disc. And it, it, there again, it's so different. It's got that lazy, isolated, lonely guitar. And we found out that that was a really good playground for me vocally. So, you know, that's kind of how you begin to massage what is going to be the end result into what you want it to be. <laughs> there it is. Glad we look young. Yeah. <laughs> young people there. <laughs> The synopsis of that is, I wasn't ready. They wanted the songs. I said, can you wait? Because I was graduating, I think, in like three, yeah, three yeah, months. And yeah. so they waited. And so then, but um, the name. The name. How did we get the name? I don't care. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. So <laughs> anyway, okay. so we go into Frontline. They like, um, so we, we had a two song demo. One of those demos was Come Alive, the song from the first CD. And we're, it's great, we love the stuff, super great. What are you guys' names? And we didn't know, we didn't know. So Frontline had a very aggressive, very clever marketing team. And they knew that since we weren't gonna be a touring band that they were gonna have to flood airwaves. So they said, hey, here's what we'll do. Let's have a contest and we'll play an excerpt of one of the songs that's gonna be on the record. And we're gonna let people name the band, so to speak. And we got several hundred names. And um, I mean, some of them were hilarious, right? We, you know, 80 pound face. We both thought that was great, right? But um, Idol Cure was actually, as it came out, was I-D-O-L Cure, right? And we actually all liked it, but we thought, well, that's a little bit heavy handed. I don't think anybody wanted, you know, these were the days of the heavy handed Christian names, yep, you know, yep. crosswalk, that type of thing. And we wanted something different because... Let's face it, in those days, all Christian bands wanted at least to be able to make a foray into the secular industry. And one of the ways that you did that, you could be as aggressive as you wanted with your lyrics, but you didn't want to give away the whole hand with your name. So that was kind of, at least for Mark and I, our thought process. We liked that a name would leave up to the imagination what it might be about. So I guess to answer that question, it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> well, it it means something to me because I went with IDLE and we thought, okay, this, we're going to get people off, off, you know, this kind of maintenance. Yeah. We're going to challenge people to yeah. deeper yeah. walks, deeper faith, deeper, whatever, not let like, be idle. Basically yeah. IDOL felt like, I don't know. It just was. Yeah. I remember one was the Hitler brothers. The Hitler brothers. Somebody oh, submitted that. Like, what the <laughs> heck? Oh, is this? Wow. Wow. Well, <laughs> I remember I was a freshman in college and you know how you are in college. Everyone's if the people that are into music, you know, where they're all, you know, talking at, and they, they gave me this cassette and they said, Rex, you have got to listen to this new band, Idol Cure. And man, I popped on breakaway and I'm like, I'm sold. Yep. This is, this is, you know, good quality produced music with a positive message. Um, and you've mentioned Come Alive, too, Steve. Uh, that is another great song from that album. Um, Overdrive and From the Heart are another two of my favorites from that. I mean, the whole album is spectacular. Um, but if if you had me to name, like, my top four songs from that, 
those are, are probably it. So how was it in the studio to do that? Did things come together um, pretty easily or was it time consuming? How, how, how was that? Tell them the story about Come Alive. Okay. And then I'll okay. tell them the story okay. about Break. Okay. So one of our last gigs at, as Sojourn, okay, with Chuck King on hand. So, you know, it was Chuck joined Sojourn in the latter days. Because like I say, Mark's on keyboards these days, so we're always looking for a guitar player, right? So we played a gig in, I want to say Arizona, Phoenix, right? We played a gig in Phoenix, right? Big church, wonderful church. It was great, right? Guys, we had all of six songs, period, on our docket, right? And so we played, we played huge, boisterous crowd and everything, and we'd finished, we were done, and we're walking off stage, and they're just stomping for an encore, right? So Mark had been playing around with the chord sequence for Come Alive, just that, but that's all about where it was at, right? So I go, dude, let's just go on stage and you just break into your riff and I'll just scat, which, you know, me, what amounted to oohs and ahs and oh yeah, wow, right? But we're all just really getting into it. Probably went on for 10 minutes and I'm looking at Mark just giving it, dude, just keep rolling. They're loving it, right? So that's how Come Alive came to be without any lyrics, just, just basically a riff. But there again, that was Mark's talents for engaging riffs. I, I can think it's the same with Breakaway, that once that riff kicks in, you're hooked, right? Mm, yep. And the rest of it, of course, there's a message that you want to get across. But Mark's right. It's all about the music. And it's all about writing good music that's gonna, that people are going to remember when they go home. Funny story about Breakaway. So we're recording this thing, and it wasn't working. Uh, the chorus wasn't working. We tried to lay it down in different ways. And it was like, wow, this song is not going to work. And and we, it almost didn't make the record because the chorus was failing. And um, I remember kind of panicking a little bit. Because mm -hmm. like you said, we had, we, I think we got together eight songs for the first record. Yeah, yeah. So oh. it's not like we had 15, you know, and let's just take the top eight. We had like seven, and let's come up with eight, because then it's not, you know, then it's not, I, I went with an EP, right? Um, and so I said, give me 24 hours, and I just went home and, and tried different angles on it, and oh, man, oh, man, and uh, and we came back, and uh, it worked, and became our anthem. Yeah. It literally became Idol Cure is synonymous with Breakaway, and it's funny that it almost didn't make the record. There again, Mark at his best. I mean, it, it, it was never pleasant knowing that he had his feet to the fire, but that's when Mark was at his creative best. So, and there's any number of songs that have happened with. Uh, on Down the Line, one of my favorite Idol Cure songs is Holy Mountain. And that's another one that almost didn't make the record. And there, Mark had written it on guitar. And in those days, we didn't even have a rehearsal studio to lay it down in. So Mark just had to kind of show it to Bill Baumgart, the producer. And even in demo stage, it wasn't working, in it, but it was just one of those songs that, you know, this is going to work. This is going to work. We, we got to, you know, keep this glued together and make it happen. And like I said, it came out, I think, probably the most atmospheric song we ever did. Yep. Well, then in 1988, your second album, Tough Love, is released, and it starts out with another great opening song, Just Believe It. Um, you know, the drums in that are, are incredible when it starts out. Um, Barter Mercy, another great song that I really like. Frontline is a great anthem song. Um, uh, another song I always kind of like, you know, the beginning of it, uh, it's a one for the money. Um, mm -hmm. I like that. I like that opening with that guy talking in that and draw the line. I mean, that was another great album. What uh, memories do you guys have of, of making that uh, record? I mean, my memories are so we're we finished the first album, right? 
Um, and gosh, it was great and it was wonderful and, you know, just good to be done with it. Like, like Mark said, he's just graduated for goodness sakes. We don't really know what, where this is going to go. Well, not only does Breakaway become our anthem, but Breakaway is being played on all rate. They don't have Christian stations in Germany. So Breakaway is being played on the radio after the Scorpions, right? So we're just getting massive airplay in Europe. And I get a call that winter, the album's only been out of two, two, three months. We get a call that winter from Eddie Huff, who became our dear friend and who kind of sponsored us in Europe. And he said, he was a road manager. He was a road manager. He said, you guys have got to come to Europe. We're booking the winter festivals and these festivals want you to be maybe their main act on the main night. And they don't even know who you are, but Breakaway is playing that hard on radio station. These guys got to see who you are. Well, we didn't even have a band, really, right? We took Dennis Holt, the drummer from AD, mm -hmm. as our drummer, right? And we, you know, kind of makeshifted it. We didn't have, you know, Chuck by now. Chuck pretty much left after the recording of the first album. So that first tour, we didn't even really have Chuck. So Mark's now on guitar, of course. And we decided, well, if we're going to do Europe, it's probably best if we try to travel light because we're going to be traveling by train and going show to show. So that's where we came up with the just one guitar in the band notion. Now, my memories are is that we were already, Frontline, of course, is already pushing for material for the second record. So I would always tease Mark, dude, no problem. We're going to be on an airplane for 16 hours. We'll write songs on the plane, right? Well, that doesn't happen. But what does happen for me, at least, is the moment we get dropped into the middle of Amsterdam and see what's happening with Youth with a Mission, I go on a creative spurt and I write the lyrics to So Many Faces and um, and um, Hungry Hearts, Hungry Hearts within a matter of three days. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my first night, you know, I closed the door to feel the cold gray pulse of the night. That was my first night walking out at two in the morning. It never gets dark in Amsterdam, so it still felt like dusk. And I happened on, I didn't know where it was, I happened on to the red light district, which was right around the corner, right? So, I mean, for me, it was eye popping. And then when you saw the just deep, intense, committed spirituality and walk of these youth with a mission people, we, we were all moved. You know, I said to Eddie once, we came here to minister and got ministered to. So it, it was very, very influential for us. And then I just about Mark. Mark, of course, Breakaway is now just going bananas everywhere, right? Well, think about the pressure on Mark now that could come out with the follow-up for Breakaway. And I thought Frontline was a brilliant follow-up because it's different. It's strong. Lyrically, it's probably even a more important message, right? And so I, I, I always look at it as even though it was an awkward time, Chuck had left. It was a very emotional time personally, but it, it allowed us to hit a different stride. I would say the, you... the takeaway for me on that record uh, was intentionality. Uh, the first record, like I said, we're scrambling. We got six songs. We got to come up with eight. What are we going to do? Once that was done and we're okay, we're, we're, we got a four record deal then every day was like, okay, how can this lead to a song? How could this lead? And, and more intentional. Uh, Just Believe It was like, okay, this is this is written to open the concert. This is this is an opening song. There, there's intentionality there. Uh, one for the money, you know, that was helping a neighbor with an addiction to, to gambling. Okay, how can I make that a song? So it was, the other is more throw it together. And Bill, you got an extra song, right? That's right. We, yeah, we yeah. can take it on there. And so, whereas <laughs> this one's more like, okay, let's approach this project. Let's be intentional. Yeah. Yeah. Mark mentions to open a concert our second time in Europe. And now, of course, now we've got the weight of two albums worth of material. So now we're feeling our oats, right? So Mark's right. You had to start your next, your second go around with Just Believe It. So I had just gotten a brand new high-powered um, wireless mic, right, which was pretty new at the time. And so we came up with the idea, we'll have the band on stage. It'll just be the drummer playing that opening sequence on drums. And then I was sitting at the very back of the auditorium, and these were two, 3,000-seat auditoriums. I'd sit at the very back in amongst the crowd with my mic just tucked in my, I was wearing a jacket back then, my mic tucked in my jacket. And then as the drum sequence, I'd pull out the mic, 
and start singing the lead vocals from the back of the crowd and then get up and start walking down towards the stage so that by the time all the music was in, I was down to the stage. And that turned out to be very effective for us. That That's cool. Yeah, Kent. Steve, if he almost never made it to the stage by the time the band was ready, or he would <laughs> always go off without a hitch. Yeah, no, I would, in fact, it, because uh, European crowds are very, very gregarious, right? So it's not like they'd be standing watching you walk by. They'd want to get up and get involved with you. So, yeah, it would be tough sometimes. <laughs> I'll be down there by the third song, guys. <laughs> Well, then, um, your third album, Second Avenue, was released in 1990. And for me, I, I'm, I'm just going to say it's probably my, if I had to pick a favorite, that's my favorite Idol Cure album. I think you guys really hit your stride on that. I agree, Rex. Um, you know, and, and here again, you guys got a thing going. The opening song is on each of your albums is spectacular. And man, what an opener with the song Pray. Um, I was just like, this is incredible. Um, Picture of Love, I love the chorus. You know, um, that's a great song. Human Solution and Talk It Out. Um, Don't Turn Away, that's just a good rocking song. If You Mean It, that is really hard hitting musically. Um, did you guys kind of, I, I know you agree with me, Steve. Uh, Mark, do, do, I know I'm asking you probably to pick your, your favorite albums like your favorite child or whatever, but like, do you think uh, Second Avenue what was the band's best or what do you feel is the band's best record? Ooh, I'm, like I said, I'm more of a song guy, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I think they all sure. have their strengths and, you know, there's some weaknesses too on, on all of them, but um Pray was an interesting song because it charted better than Breakaway. Really? Yeah. In fact, they called us to come, remember, to... It was nominated a, for a double award. Yeah, GMA and do all that. We never got that kind of recognition. Um, it charted. It was number one on every thing. Breakaway was just charting, but it wasn't number one. Right, right. And I remember we were always confused about that because mm -hmm. we didn't make hardly any money on it, <laughs> which is a whole nother topic. It's like, how can it be number one in the country and we get it nominated for a dove award or whatever? And yeah, and, anyway. And talk it out. I feel is Mark's best rock song and it wasn't even released on the radio. So hmm. it's hard to figure, right? But anyway, yeah. to short answer to your question, I would say uh, I invested the most of me in it out. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that was probably it. Yeah, yeah. I think Mark's special project is Inside Out. Okay. Yes. Yeah. He, like he said, he had a he had a huge emotional investment. It wasn't just intentional. Mark invested very heavily in that. Well, and investing meaning um, time. You're there for tracking of everything. Yeah. You're not just leaving it to the producer. Um, that kind of thing. So let's just talk about that. I mean, again, there's a pattern here. The very first song, we've lost ground. Another great opener holy mountain as you've talked about steve um another great song and i love the lyrics to it i will hold on um that that gets me um mark just tell me then what all was going on or whatever you want to share what what uh this album is special to you can you kind of tell us more about what you mean by that or the circumstances were around that maybe i just had more time i wasn't preoccupied mm -hmm. with school and a young kid and all that mm -hmm. we were more like you said in the stride of it more planning going into mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. he had to invest more i had started a new job oh that's right and literally this was a sales job i had gone from managing a gallery to an outside sales job where they kind of you know wanted to milk blood right and I mean, it was kind of staggering because the first day I was there, the sales manager sits down with me and says, Steve, listen, 
I want it to be understood. No more of this rock star crap. You either invest in this or you, you don't take this job, blah, 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 blah. Right. So I was kind of feeling the heat there and I, I, I could, it probably affected me psychologically. So I didn't have near the songwriting input on this one than of previous ones. So that of course put more pressure on Mark. Mm -hmm. And also for me, psycho psychologically it was tougher because now I'm going into the studio kind of in secret, right? I mean, the thing, and I know it's been brought up a long time, but we all kept our day jobs because we didn't want our ministry in, in the early days there were too many bands, you know, unless you were Striper or Petra or Whiteheart, you, man, you were struggling out there on the road, right? Mm -hmm. And you'd hear reports of bands calling up record companies saying the bus got a flat tire and we don't have money for a new tire, you know, can, and we didn't, it wasn't that we didn't want to go live the hard struggling musician life. It was that since it was a ministry, we did not want to let those elements of the ministry have to affect what we were getting across. And so that way it kind of kept it free and clear of having to, such mundane things as, you know, paying bills. <laughs> yeah. So, so like, you know, from like 90 and 91, like um, how, how much touring did you do then since you guys had jobs, were you doing very much touring or were you kind of just like a, a studio band per se? No, we, we, we pretty much fell into a rhythm of a European tour, every record, um and fly dates and yeah and yep. weekend okay. fly dates. mostly yeah. festivals okay okay yeah. and then of course you had the amusement park gigs here at our end mm -hmm. uh magic mountain disneyland mm -hmm. knott's berry farm all around new year's all, all that we could drive to in a couple hours right okay. and and great exposure so we we took advantage of those wherever we could yeah. and to steve's point we weren't under the pressure a lot of bands during that day you pay we'll play um it had to make sense yeah you know from a from a impact standpoint from a, a, a size standpoint so like you said we would do more of the high profile festivals and those kind of things um weren't against the other but we didn't have the pressures of money um so that helped a lot mm -hmm. well and it sounds like you must have had a pretty large fan base over in Europe then I presume if you toured for every album there. No, when right? I say tour, two weeks, three weeks. So it wasn't a three month, six month tour mm -hmm. just to qualify, but we would go over there and within three weeks, we'd probably play at least every other day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And those were the smaller gigs, but those were non-Christian gigs. Right. So it wasn't Christian festival world there was a couple but for the most part we're playing packed out bars smoke everywhere two thousand people and they're all singing your song and you can't sp speak the same language yeah. so it was a very yeah. different so you had to have an interpreter if you're going to talk or share and so it was very interesting yeah the europe gigs were fascinating because you you'd have say a flavo festival which would have 15 to twenty thousand people and you think, well, that was the big hurrah. Now we're going to do a little, you know, I mean, we did the occasional air base too, but yep. your typical gig in Europe would be these, uh, these auditoriums that are like basketball kind of little mini stadium sort of things. Right. Mm -hmm. Man, Mark, like Mark said, they would pack that to the brim up to the top of the bleachers with 2,500, 3,000 feet. And, and you're all in an enclosed gymnasium. It was raucous. I mean, it was just be boom, 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 boom. And of course, I fell in love with those European subwoofer based sound systems. Sure. They would just kick butt. <laughs> you could just, man, and we have Dave Jansen in those days, and he would just ramp up the low end. So you could just hear that room just pulsating. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then your contract with Frontline um, was done. Um, and then three years later, <clears throat> you released the album Eclipse in 1994. Um, and I really love this album, too. You know, songs like What's Your Point of View, Pour Out My Soul, 
uh shake it up has that really cool guitar sound mark i really like that um bring me through the day a great closing song um any thoughts about making that record or how that came to be with going on a different label uh was it after it was after the fourth record with with um yeah the big difference there was working with billy smiley instead of bill Baumgart. okay see he had a completely different approach uh bill Baumgart, at least from a vocal standpoint was very 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 coachy hands-on right and i loved that because bill helped me become a better singer billy smiley is dude just go in there and sing we'll catch it on tape and fix any oops in the mix right Billy mm -hmm. was a let it flow kind of guy, right? Okay. And uh, I mean, I like that as well, too. You know, I, I remember when Bill Baumgart heard the last record and Mark asked him, well, what did you think? And he says, well, Steve sounds a little rushed, right? Which was not a, a backhand. It's just Bill was saying, I'd have taken more time on some of these parts and gotten maybe a more technically perfect performance and at the risk of losing a little of the feeling. So... For me, there was that difference, and it was substantial. Just for the record, there were no tuners back then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so also the relationships on that record. So when we finished with Frontline, um, Star Song approached us, and they had just lost Petra, and they wanted us to fill their slots. Okay. So they flew out, and we flirted with that, talked that through. And when we realized how many dates, they wanted like what? 150? A year? Yeah, something like that. One at 150 days yeah. a year. And so, you know, that's the dates. That's not counting travel. So, you know, we're like, okay, should we quit our jobs? Should we not? You know, and it's, it felt like a call, kind of a call to missions work. You know, when you're gone that lot, this isn't, and then, you know, you got kids and you're not seeing your kids or if you bring them on the road, then that's complicated. So we passed, basically. And by then we'd settled into a pretty comfortable uh, sense of, where I, our identity was, right? right? It's like, well, we're happy selling 150,000 of every single unit and being able to go to Europe and still having festivals that want us. And that now, by now that works into our framework just fine. You know, we don't, we don't need to go out and be rock stars. We're happy just sure. having our own ministry. And so we didn't have a record deal at the time. And so we referred the name Eddie. Um, Eddie and one or two other guys formed Salt Records. And so we were obviously had the relationship. Let's do a record. We'd gotten to know Whiteheart really good because we did tours with them. And so that's when we approached Billy. Mm -hmm. uh, by then, Bill had moved, relocated to Nashville. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it was a relational record. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody's in Nashville. Yeah. You know, that's what makes it difficult for Christian artists in California. Everybody's Correct. in Nashville. So there was always the thing, gosh, I don't care if you moved to Nashville, you, you'd have it made. And like, but like Mark said, that meant changing everything. And by now we all have homes kind of thing. Right. So yeah. there was a lot to consider in making that leap. And Mark would always say, dude, really realistically, it's 1990. How much longer are we going to be able to do this? And sure enough, with the advent of Nirvana, and grunge, the landscape changes, right? So yep. now you're either having to, like Mark would say, write a totally different style of music that's a little foreign to you, or try to keep rehashing the same thing and hoping that you, your fan base is gonna stick around. So are those kind of the two reasons right there that that was the last Idol Cure album, the living in California and the musical landscape changing so drastically? No, uh, I don't think so. Mm -mm. I think um, it was, like I said earlier when we started, I don't, I don't know, was this before we're doing our interview, that um, my situation changed. Um, it was getting very stressful to, um, you know, fly out on Friday night, play a Saturday night concert, come home on Sunday, pick up a briefcase and go to work you know, Monday morning. And it got to the point where, you know, I'm preaching the gospel or sharing something on the stage somewhere and my marriage is struggling or my family is, isn't seeing me. It's like, you know what, this, this isn't sustainable. Um, so I'm going to tuck back. And um, that's when I jokingly said, you guys can keep it going. 
Just tell me where to show up. So I don't think we never volitionally said, okay, we're done. This is it. This is our last record. This is our last gig. Swan song. Let's go. It just kind of faded mm -hmm. and probably everybody else was getting a little busy. And like I said, we didn't need it for the money. So there wasn't that constantly push like, Hey, we're dying. We got to get a tour together. We got to write another record. Um, it was hard. It was hard. You'd yeah. be in the studio till 3 a.m. and then come home and get two hours sleep and three hours sleep and go to work. Yeah. Um, so we we talk about it provided that it didn't have the pressure of money, but it had the pressure of time. Yeah. Yeah. Because, um, you know, you got an agent and he wants to book you, a booking agent, <laughs> and, you know, he makes money when you go. And so how much it attention are you going to get of him if you limit him to six gigs a year in their festivals right and so there was that tension like i need a touring band because i can get you tours but you guys won't go and so we're balancing that and then you're at work and goals go up and so it just got to a place i think where yeah it just plus if you guys have gathered we t always tended to travel light I mean, Tough Love, there's only Mark and I and Pete on the cover, and that basically was the band. So we would contract out a drummer because Mark and I in those days believed, well, gosh, it'd be nice to have one sound in the studio, but then a live drummer kind of brings a whole different set of tools to the show, right? Yep. So we would love that. And, and then another gig would be, well, do we want a bass player or live or do we not want a bass player live? So there would be that, but it also kept us if it was, well, this decision's coming up, well, Mark and I could get on the phone because there wasn't five people that you had to all run through the chain and make sure everybody approved of something. We could keep things very centralized and make these decisions without involving too many people. Well, Mark, since you brought this up, I'm going to ask this question. I'm sure you guys get this all the time. Okay, so we're, we're probably never going to see Idol Cure um, in concert possibly ever. But, like, what about some new studio material, even like, say, a, a five or four song EP? Do, do we think there's any chance that we'll ever see any new Idol Cure music? <laughs> um. Mark's going to so, be retiring soon, no, so, so I'm going to keep hitting it. Yeah, up. maybe. maybe. <laughs> uh, we we union thing. We flirted with all that. We watched Petra try it. We watched uh, Petra and Whiteheart try it. Um, unfortunately, in Christian music, unlike just everyday music, you know, you don't have an oldies station. Um, you do in what Steve would call secular um, music. Uh, you have oldie stations, retro stations. There's still an audience for that. You don't have that in Christian music. Mm -hmm. And again, to put the band together, to rehearse the band, has overhead. Um, and there's money that's involved. And you don't just record. Uh, that costs money. So guys do GoFundMe and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, the Petras, the Whitehearts, who were arguably more more popular than we were and had more gigs under their belt, i.e. more of a following, couldn't make it work. Um, so it sounds good, but, you know, we're coming to Arkansas. Idol Cure's coming to Arkansas, and we'll see the, you know, 15 people that saw us in Ohio 30 years ago. If, if you could get all 2,000 yeah. fans together in one place every night, it'd be perfect, right? Maybe we could do a virtual concert. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. But your question about more music... I mean, that's a good point, Steve. The more I slow down, the more I could wake up. I don't know. <laughs> but see, well, just, just a Mark's thought, a guy you know, like... that Mark's not going to be content to go out and ride another breakaway, uh, you right, know, 2025 right. breakaway. My, right. Mark's going to want to bring 
all of the experience that every we've all lived in between, right? And bring that into a new kind of format, a new song that's still a vital cure, but that, you know, brings something new that's worth listening to. So I know he would take that to the table when he sat down putting pen to the paper. Well, and I got a resource. My son's an MD uh, in LA in the music business. And uh, so he would definitely help he us. He would help us. Yeah. yeah. So but maybe, maybe Rex. It's interesting. I just saw a, a post by Michael Sweet saying that he's not sure if Striper can keep touring out there because touring's become so expensive. And to which I say, man, if Striper can't make a go of it, then you really start, you know, looking at the, the fine line here. I just noticed there's a new festival coming up and, and it, it amazes me. There's still quite a few of the Christian festivals, but it takes a lot of bands these days to make a festival happen and get the right amount of people there, right? Mm -hmm. You used to could do an ichthus and you could do three, four bands a day and have it for a whole weekend. And now, man, you need to put 15 bands on stage in three days to get the crowd there. So it's tougher. It's a tougher crowd. From a business perspective, yeah, yeah. it's tougher. Kent, you had a question? Well, I was just going to make mention, you know, Mark and Steve, of course, old season pros there. Um, but in this day and age, it's, you know, people can record and have a have really good quality product just through home yeah. recordings with modern technology. Yeah. I just wanted to make mention, you know, Steve and Mark, you guys are still very much revered and loved and appreciated. Your music was top notch quality. I really feel like there is a fan base to at least want to purchase some new product from you guys. If you guys could maybe do that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, and it's the industry's changed. Um, yes. Not only from a business standpoint. Um, and again, I know this through my son, artists don't make any money for the most part, unless you're maybe Katy Perry or somebody, you know, uh, Swift. Um, they don't make money on downloads. They don't make money on people buying their records. They make money on touring. Mm -hmm. So, but it costs still, you know, even though you got in-home studios and all that, you gotta, you gotta have the right people to run them. We're mm -hmm. not that. So it's, it would be a thing to put together. It wouldn't, it would be harder, not easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but it's not out of the question. Who knows? One of the things that we got spoiled by is even though we rarely had any money for a budget, that first album was made on $18,000 budget. We ran out of money for cover art, and that's why you've got the Choo Choo Train Red Ball cover, because, you know, <laughs> we got what we could sort of thing. But um, I always like to think that in spite of the fact that we had to be very frugal when it came to studio money, we still were not afraid to get the great player for the right part or wait until we got the right part, or made sure we had the right drum sound. And that, to me, is very important, because when I hear guys like you that I know know the industry, and you comment not only on the performances, but on the production standards, I know for Mark and I, that's very critical. That, man, the fact that you don't have a lot of money doesn't mean you don't strive for a high production level. Mm -hmm. You, you, you got to go for it, right? Yeah, well, and I'm telling you, like, your albums, you know, to me, you could put them right up with the Def Leppards mm -hmm. of the day and all of those other bands. Production-wise, uh, Steve, it was top-notch. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really was. You were not embarrassed to play this in front of your non-Christian friends, and they'd be like, well, that sounds like junk. What in the world is that? You know, it, well, see, you didn't get that. that. You say that. Yeah. It, it's funny you mentioned that, because we actually checked in and uh, to see if, if Mutt Lang would produce a song um, on Idol Cure, because we saw what he did with Def Leppard, we saw what he did with Brian Adams, we saw what he did mm -hmm. with Foreigner, um, and one song would have been our whole budget. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. Wow. We found out we couldn't even afford Brown Bannister, so, you know. <laughs> but uh, you should mention Def Leppard. I, I will say that when we went into the studio, and background vocals became key, especially once I could enlist the services of Bob Carlyle, right? That mm -hmm. Def Leppard, in terms of background vocals, was the standard. You yep. know, that was the standard. That's I won't say we achieved that, but that was certainly what was in our head going in when we said, all right, what do you want? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember I remember listening to that record on a train in, in Europe. We were, yeah. on, we were on tour. And I remember hearing Photograph and go, wow. 
you know, just like everybody has those moments. I, you probably remember when you heard the first Van Halen cut and you said, who plays like that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> it was one of those moments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because early Def Leppard is <laughs> yeah. not like you would think. No. my money you guys were the kings of arena rock and i mean that in a in a uh, that's a reverent term you guys were the kings of arena rock steve i'd like to ask you personally uh you know glenn kaiser i kind of esteem him as kind of the best vocalist around but uh you're right I up there with him so man. steve how does it feel to have one of the best voices in rock and roll well I, that's an incredibly kind compliment um i don't you know, I never, to me, voices are so distinct, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you, in fact, it was funny when I was driving up here to Marks and everything, and an early Van Halen song came on, right? And I thought to myself, you know, David Lee Roth is not credited as being one of the greatest rock singers around. But for me, it's about unique voices. Mm -hmm. And David Lee Roth always had one of the most unique voices, mm -hmm. right? So you could have the screamers, you could have the Steve Perry of Journey or Brad Delp of Boston. They were wonderful. They, you know, they were wow. But um, to me, voices are unique. And the more unique, kind of the more character you can get out of it. So like I say, we, when Mark and I started playing, there was no Sir Sojourn song that was sung as heavily as Breakaway was. So it was through, and, and of course there was no, um, I wasn't singing any secular stuff back in the days that was really that hard, right? So it was through singing Mark's material that I kind of developed what I'm going to call the raspy growl voice, right? And that really only came about as an interpretive effort for Mark's song. So that you should say that means a great deal, but I, I think a singer is kind of representative only of the material he gets to sing. I got an interesting story about Glenn Kaiser. We were playing in. Hold that, hold that story real mm -hmm. quick. Let me, since we're on Steve, he, his tenacity in the studio was unparalleled. And, and the reason I say that is today, you know, when a, when a vocalist goes in, they lay down a track and then they auto tune them. It's just part of the deal. When they play live concerts, they auto tune, um, you know, worship teams at, at our churches are auto tuned. Um, we didn't have auto-tune then. Right. And so it either sounded good or it sounded bad. And if it was bad, then do it again till it sounds good. Yeah. And so it was so taxing that literally, I mean, I think maybe one song, maybe two, you would track in one day, primarily one. We'd have to space them out yeah, because it was so rigorous in terms of uh, of the like you said, the hard driving, that wears the vocals out. And, you know. It was also the reason that it was such a relief to get in help on the background vocals, because of course you would want to do the leads before you laid down the backing tracks. Mm -hmm. But if you're investing that hard and heavy, because I mean, none of these vocals were sung softly except for the ballads, right? But, um, you know, you needed some help on those backgrounds because now you're starting to really, really wear the, the tread thin on the tires, you know? But we were playing in, in the middle of winter. It was cold and we were in Germany and I was getting a sore throat, right? And Mark, bless his heart, everywhere we went, he'd make sure I had on my scarf, said, dude, you can't get sick. You can't get sick, right? You gotta protect your voice, right? So we were going in and I was looking around and in walks Glenn Kaiser. They were playing the same concert we were playing that night. In fact, I think they were opening for us, right? And uh, anyway, so we were backstage. They had just finished their set when we were backstage getting ready to go on. This was our first tour in front of big crowds and pretty much within a handful of our first gigs, period, right? And Glenn Kaiser walks into the dressing room and says, Hi! And he just screams it out in there, right? Perfect pitch, just perfect and everything. We all started cracking up. And I was talking to him and I laughed. I said, I got a little bit of a sore throat. He says, dude, I got just the thing. 
and he pulls out this little packet. It was called Fisherman's Friend, right? And it was these cough drops. And oh my gosh, it was like he would just put sheer menthol on the back of your throat. These things were so Couldn't intense. Feel thing. Couldn't feel a thing. <laughs> And Glenn says, I swear by him, I can't live without him, right? Yeah. Man, I, I was never without those things on another tour, especially in winter. So, yeah, we, we had great memories of playing with them. There were there were bands that were great musicians that we respected. Mark and I always highly respected Whiteheart. Uh, we would catch their shows whenever we could at festivals we were playing. And Res Band was one of those in, bands that you just, you just fed off their energy. But it was so sensational. And the interplay between... Uh, Glenn and Wendy was just remarkable. So yeah, there were bands that were good players that you'd watch. And then there were bands that were fun that you got to know and, and really got close to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, go ahead, Kent. Well, just like, just like Glenn, you know, Steve, Glenn, you guys not only have the rasp, you have the range too. And it's just a winning combination. I'd like to ask really quick, just, my, my first introduction to you guys was actually the Tough Love album. I still remember picking up the tape in, in 88, sitting there while my mom and grandma were in, they went into Kroger and I'm listening for the first time to Idle Cure <laughs> and uh, became a fan. So um, I would like to ask, and forgive me because sometimes, you know, Steve and Mark, sometimes you, all you know about an artist for 20 plus years is what you see. So I don't know if I'm pronouncing Pete's last name right. Is it Lomakin? Lomakin. Lomakin. So, so there you go. So, so I'm learning Pete Lomakin, and then um, you know Clark Edmund. Um, you know he came on board with uh, Second Avenue as the drummer. So I'm just curious as to I think you know Pete was there from the first album, but when did Pete come into the fold, and then when did Clark officially come into the fold as the drummer? So that last gig as Sojourn did not include Pete. So Pete was literally added in that interim period between when Sojourn ended and the genesis for Idle Cure happened, right? Um, to be honest with you. Side note, he said many times I played keyboards. The only reason I played keyboards is we could never find a keyboardist. Right. And so I think we were looking for, we were I don't looking. remember how we entered. What did we meet Pete? I don't recall. I don't either. I think we met him through a friend and friend, you know, whatever. But they always knew we were looking for a keyboard. Player. It seems to me that Chuck knew Pete. So I'm going to guess that the introduction was through Chuck. Because Chuck had, Chuck always kind of had his own musical things. Um, and he would do with, with other groups and everything. And I, I think Chuck was kind of looking for the simpatico that Mark and I had shared from the beginning with somebody, um, i.e. a Ken Tamplin, not to bring, but you know, everybody wants that. And you know, you look at all good musical acts and it seems to be there's two people mm -hmm. that need the energy of one another to really function properly, mm -hmm. rather. Whether it's Lennon and McCartney or Don Henley and Glenn Fry, or you know, you name it. You need a, that combination of people and then they kind of both feed and challenge one another. Mm -hmm. So um, we, you know, it, that kind of was that. And then Pete came along, like Mark said, we'd long been looking for a keyboardist. Didn't really settle on a permanent drummer until Clark. And even then, I think Stevie D played drums on the second album. Right there, I remember. Yeah. Even then, I think Steve DeStanislo was the drummer. Now, that guy, I don't know how familiar we We got him when he was just a kid. I think he went to Europe with us and he was barely 19. And he was already one of the best drummers in the industry. So we'd have nabbed him, but by then he was already getting his name around. And we'd, you know, we'd call him up and say, Stevie D, can you do a concert coming? And he says, oh, no, man, sorry. I'm, I got to play for Paul Anka in Vegas. He's paying me 10 grand for three nights, right? <laughs> so he was already running around even as a kid doing his thing. And of course, now he pays for David Gilmore, right? I mean, it's, wow. it's remarkable. He's that good. Mm -hmm. But we always made Eric Marienthal on sax is a perfect example. He was a puppy when he did those sax parts on the first album. And he's one of the most revered sax players around. So we've always been blessed with great talent who lended their abilities to our efforts and really enhanced the projects, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, where can fans connect with you guys at... Um... Just kind of wondering that. I know there's a lot of fans out there. Where would be the best place that fans could 
you know, connect with you guys at? Facebook. That's probably the best. Facebook. I think we have an Instagram account. I used to pay attention to that a lot. But as you guys know, when you wrote me, you probably didn't get an immediate response. I don't know how long it took, but um, yeah, I would say Facebook. If it's anything with, to do with tech, it's got to be Mark. Um, cause I, I'm absolutely tech non savvy. Um, I, I have become friends with a lot of fans on Facebook, just personal friends, mm -hmm. because frankly, I just can't say no, because in my opinion, if these people 40 years later are still willing to carry the love for that music and keep that music alive, then, oh my gosh, they're certainly worthy of my time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there is an I don't cure Facebook and on there there's, you know, videos and, um, uh, Yeah. Steve, on that note, what you just said, carrying the love for you guys, um, you know, Rex and I were, we, we've often talked about this between us, Rex and myself, and, and with some other artists too, but you know, you guys growing up, you all were, as our youth ministers, um, the, the music hooked us, you guys were the kings of arena rock, I'll say it again, and like Mark was saying, you know, it, it had to have a, a, a hook, you know, and it, and it was, you guys were kings of that, Um and as I was telling somebody else not long ago, you know, I have, uh, I grew up in the church since I was in fourth grade, have heard many sermons and, you know, received the Lord, but I have forgotten the messages of, well, so many of those sermons, mm -hmm. but you see the gift, you know, every good and perfect gift is from the father of the heavenly lights. And he certainly blessed you all with the gift of music and and imparting that, he knew you all would be faithful vessels. And my point, Steve and Mark, is that 40 years later, I can still pop in an Idol Cure album and not only hear great music that pumps me up, but it pumps me up for the Lord. I can hear that message again and again. And that's why you guys are so, I feel like why you guys are so special, not only to Rex and me, but to countless others. And may I just say thank you for being faithful to the Lord because I'm still being blessed all these years later. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Ken, did you have anything else that we're going to wind down here? Oh, you know, I could ask Steve how he's enjoying his boat. I saw a post that he <laughs> made about having a, I think it's a new boat. You know, I can ask about that or, uh, you know, I know Mark's a pastor. I can ask him about his pastor and how all that <laughs> So. Well, I'd love to tell you about my boat. <laughs> Talk to me. You know, yeah. you know, it's funny because Mark was just saying um, he has he, he's gotten a cabin up in Montana and he's got a, a runabout that he takes on the lakes and, and streams up there. And he was saying to me, he says, Steve, as God is my witness, I never thought I'd be buying a boat before you did, because I've, <laughs> I've always been around boats. My dad had sailboats and I'm sure Mark thought I'd go out and get a sailboat. I'm, I'm just getting a little long in the tooth to be going out on my own on the ocean. So I found myself a good lake and the right boat for it. So yeah, I'm still a little new, new at it, but it's exciting. Thanks for asking. You bet, you bet. So would like to ask, you know, I've, I, I don't know how recent they are, but I have seen latter years pictures, more modern, more recent pictures, I should say. And it's got you all and Pete and I think Clark and even one with or two with Chuck. I mean, it seems like you guys still kind of have that friendship and that overall bond with everybody today. Is oh, that, you're probably is that accurate? Team trips and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're still all friends and stay in touch to various degrees. Yeah. And Chuck, and Chuck recently moved to Boise. Hmm. So he's a little bit, he was, he was right here local until just a couple years ago, but they've moved up to be near kids in Boise. And um, so, you know, I'm, you, you tend to spread apart a little bit, but, but yeah, we've done things together wherever possible and, and vacations together and whatnot. So you bet we've stayed in Ooh. touch. Wonderful. And Mark, you, my last, I guess my last question to ask is you've been a pastor now. Did you say 30 plus years you've been a pastor of a church? 30, 30. Yeah. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, we're kind of winding down here, guys, but 
Um, the last question I'd like to ask is uh, from both of you is what words of wisdom and or what would you like to say to all your friends and fans out there? Ooh. Uh, thanks for the year. No. Um, I, I would, it's humbling. Um, I would say that the, the biggest journey for me is meeting all the people. Um, you know, because when you're doing it in a closet or in a studio or whatever, it's very um, uh, clinical. Uh, but to be out there and to be interacting with people of different denominations, uh, different languages, different cultures. That's been a real eye-opening thing for me that even goes into the pastorate that, you know, we can often think the little myopic circles we run in is, is the reality where it's, it's, it's much broader and bigger. And so I'm super grateful. Um, and I'm super grateful to the fans that have supported mm -hmm. us um, and, you know, purchased records and allowed us to, you know, get enough income to do it again and again and again. Um, so we don't take that lightly. Um, it's funny early on. I don't know how many times we would, people would pick us up from the airport and they put in our cassette tape, but it'd be a bootleg. It would be like, you know, they made copies and it was like, <laughs> it's like, huh? Okay. <laughs> you know, and then you come to find out that they can't find it anywhere. Yeah. You know, and that was so frustrating because people would want, the product and then it wasn't available because record stores would sell out and not reorder or whatever. So we saw bootlegs. So that was even humbling that people were like, well, I can't buy it, but I'm still going to play it. And so thank you. That was, a, it was just been a good run. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say be ever faithful because I, I, you know, I, I look at Mark and I sit next to him, Mark here. We've been friends for 45 years and that friendship was kind of based on this collaboration that may or may not work. And we were certainly having to put our faith in Christ because, you know, we didn't know then and it was going to be blessed enough to be able to still be talking about it 45 years later, right? So like Mark said, the blessing that it has been and the people that have come along the way and what moves me are that people like you would still be so animated about it. I mean, this is old music and we're old dogs, you know, but we're still talking about it. And, you know, I'll get on Facebook all the time, how your music has moved me all these years. And it touches me deeply, guys. It really, really does. Because, you know, you think, well, gosh, that's a body of music that you wrote way back then that, like you say, should be out of mind, out of sight, out of time. And yet if it's still reaching people, then that means I think you did something worthwhile and that God blessed it. Mm -hmm. On that note, really quick, Steve. You all play great music, and of course, that's a gift from the Almighty, and the good news of Christ is in there. Y'all are rooted in that, and the Almighty is timeless. Yep. You guys are timeless. You guys are awesome, and thank you for this opportunity. It's been a privilege today. Oh, you guys were great. Thank you so much. Well, guys, we, we always close out with something we call message from home. And how Kent says it, you know, we always want to keep the main thing, the main thing. And we always close out with a verse of scripture um, that pertains to the band or an album of theirs or a song. And um, I'm going to be reading from Ephesians chapter four, verses 21 through 24. And your song Breakaway was the first song that I ever heard by the band. And I've selected a passage of scripture that I think describes the lyrics in the song. And uh, the scripture reads, when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God and true righteousness and holiness. And the song Breakaway in the course tells us to leave the old life. And we just want to thank you guys for spending time with us and all the great songs and all the great messages that you have given us through the years. So 
thank you so much again, guys, for spending your time with us today. We really appreciate that. We appreciate you guys Absolutely too. Absolutely well, welcome. Rex, thanks for doing this. Bless you guys. Thanks so much. And and just hang on with us, but we're gonna go say goodbye to everyone, and we'll we ask you to stick around for a moment, guys. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>